Hi everyone, my name is Rhiannon from Blue Dog Board Games and today we're going to be continuing our solo vlogs and we're going to be covering all the games that I played solo in the months of February and March. I will try and keep this one brief because a lot of the games that I am covering today I have spoken about before in the channel. There are a few extra things that I want to say about a couple of them that I have spoken about before because I may have played them in a different way or it's been a very long time since I've spoken about it so I do want to just sort of update a couple of games but otherwise there are a few new ones I do want to speak about in this sort of setting and you may have seen some playthroughs of those on the channel as well. But anyway February and March are sort of along the same lines as usual I'm about averaging an hour a day this is compared to last year my gaming has just dropped dramatically I think I think in March last year I did like 56 hours of gaming which is just insane so I'm not sure what I was maybe I was playing Frost Taming or something but my motivation or my energy levels have dropped significantly since then and we are definitely not reaching that. But in February this year we have played 41 different games or 41 plays covering 27 hours uh, and I have played every single day. So we are still continuing our daily plays and I am still keeping that up but uh, uh, not sort of deliberately. It's just very much become part of my routine now So although I know that I'm not sort of pushing to play every single day It is just something naturally that I do feel like I want to do but it's nice to have that uh, The expectation of it being removed from me even though that was an expectation I set to myself uh, But anyway, the first game that we're going to be talking about today is a game that I played nine times in February over eight hours so just about 45 minutes 50 minutes per play and that is Oranienburger Canal by Uwe Rosenberg. So this is a game that I acquired as because of the solo Uwe Rosenberg series that I am doing I'm trying to do playthroughs of some of his more well-known and well-loved solo games and ones that are a particular interest to me and putting the playthroughs out and I will shortly <sighs> somewhat shortly be doing a ranking video of all of those solo modes. Aurelian Burger Canal is slightly different to his other games in that uh, Uwe usually focuses on like one to four player games and they usually have like a farming theme to them whether that's like crop farming, animal farming, that sort of thing. But Oranian Burger Canal is quite different in that it is a one to two player game only. Cannot play it at more than that, so it feels much tighter and much more streamlined in terms of uh, like the, the work placement areas that you can go to, etc. It's also not got a farming theme at all. There's not a crop or an animal in sight. So it was a bit of a culture shock to me, I think, um, picking this one up as compared to his other titles. This is one that I have definitely heard so much about from a solo point of view. It's one that everyone has, or a lot of people have said that it's like his, his top solo game. They're really ranking it very highly. And so I knew that I wanted to play this one. I actually saw it on crowdfunding when it was originally up a year or two ago. And I didn't go for it because I didn't like the look of it. Um, that was honestly something that turned me off completely to it, but knowing once it was released that the gameplay was actually really good, I was like, I, I just need to go for it at some point. So if you're unfamiliar with Oranian Burger Canal, it's such a mouthful, Oranian Burger Canal. This is a game where you have a player mat in front of you, and I think there's 12 spaces, and each space can house one building or a structure they call them and each structure can have four different routes around it and these routes can be like pathways, roads, railway tracks and canals and you are able to build these buildings structures out on your player board and activate them usually up to twice during a game and that's usually where some of your like point generations and resource uh, accumulation is going to come from. You activate these structures by either surrounding them on all four sides by different root types or you can also build bridges from these structures to neighbouring structures and the second bridge that you build from a structure activates that structure a second time or a first time if you happen to build the bridge before you fully surround it. So this game is actually quite clever in how you need to sort of be careful about when you're activating different structures to really get the full benefit of them because some of them um, is, is like a cumulative in the like, resources or the points that you get. So for example, it might be like if you've got four canals surrounding it at one time, um, uh, when it's activated, you will get X amount of points. 
but if you're actually activating it when it's only surrounded by one canal at a particular time but you're still building its like second bridge that's impossible actually two canals and you're building the second bridge from it it will be not sort of reaching its maximum capacity and point accumulation so it's a very interesting game where you have to be quite clever about when you do things how you activate things what order and just sort of be a bit more mindful about that sort of stuff as well as that this game has a really interesting like, resource wheel where you have your like basic resources of your like, is it your wood and your stone and your ore um, but you can also have your like, processed resources like your bricks and there's another one I'm, I'm not sure what it is but your, your more valuable resources and at any time you can sort of push this wheel around and every time you push the wheel around it alters the number of resources of everything you've got and you can also trade in your money to like move this wheel around in which ways you want and you also have a free movement of this wheel once per round it's a very interesting little game also in comparison to some of his other titles like uh, like Kavana or even <laughs> the big one, A Feast for Odin. This only has seven action spots available to you. And so this feels like a, such a tighter experience and so much more streamlined in a number of ways. It's much less sandboxy and, than some of his others. And it feels much more of a, uh, what do you call it? Like a, an efficiency puzzle to try and squeeze as much points as possible out and not explore necessarily everything that's going on in the game although you are going to be exploring it but I just feel like some of his other titles are a bit more choose your pathway and everything's going to sort of get you points no matter what you're doing but this Iranian Burger Canal is not particularly like that. So Iranian Burger Canal um, it was a little bit of a miss for me. I did enjoy it um, but I will say like a few of the things just didn't hit the mark for me and the main one being its like, visual presentation. I do not like the, the colour palette of this game, the graphic design is very plain and very, it, it's quite a jar compared to what we sort of expect in terms of the, the quality nowadays. Um, also as well and this is the biggest thing for me is the ability to read all the structure cards and the iconography now this game is almost the whole like soul of it is based on its replayability with the number of cards that the game includes as well as you can acquire the expansions which further enhances replayability there are so many cards in this game and each of the cards are very unique in terms of how they score and how they activate it could be resource based it could be point based it could be uh like the route based around and they're doing quite complex things and so once you put all of that together i understand why the iconography has to be so complex but it was definitely a stepping stone for me and a barrier to me enjoying the game and even teaching the game. It was when my husband was very up for playing with me, but I could really feel that tension of that and that frustration coming out of the third time looking at this card and we, I still can't remember what it does and I need to look it up in the book. Now, obviously it's great that these cards have so much variability and so much complexity there because it makes for a very strategic game but its iconography just is not particularly clear unless you are going to be a seasoned gamer of this particular type of game and this title if you're going to be playing it 20 times back to back then by your 20th play you'll, you'll be you know pushing that aside and not a problem but it definitely is a problem if it's going to be a title you pull off your shelf maybe once or twice a year and that is something that that I felt was definitely drawing me away from the game. On top of that as well, I did just generally feel a bit more restricted with this game. I think I have learned that I prefer his much more open box titles, um, like A Feast for Odin, go and do whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, you can focus on your animals or you can focus on your like trading goods. You can just basically earn points whatever you want to do. This one is, is much different than that. You don't really get any of those aspects you are efficiency puzzling trying to get as many points as possible by careful, careful uh, like spatial puzzliness and uh, it just the, the theme of it as well just didn't tick the right boxes there's no animals no crops I and I have no genuine interest in like 
buildings and infrastructure and all of that sort of stuff so as much as it is a very good game and I can imagine and I understand why people like it because its replayability is very very high it's a game that uh just maybe isn't for me so that is Oranian Bugger Canal I will pop the link down below if you did want to see the the solo playthrough of that one that I did and some more in-depth final thoughts because I cover that at the very end of the video if you did want to see that but uh, let's go on to the rest of the games I played in February. So next on my list was Turing Machine. Uh, I haven't actually touched Turing Machine for a little while. I need to get it back out because I, I did go through a phase of doing it every single day as like a warm up. But um, that sort of fizzled out a little bit and that's a shame because it was something that was really nice to do. Anyway, I played that one eight times in February, one and a half hours. My husband and I really enjoyed doing that one together. I wouldn't recommend it at any higher play accounts than that unless you are very equally matched in terms of the speed at which you work these puzzles out. Otherwise, people are going to be twiddling their thumbs and waiting for each other. Uh, the next one is Expeditions. So I won't talk about that one because I would need to um, uh, mark this video as sponsored because I was kindly given that one by Stonemaier Games and I did a solo playthrough of that one as well so if you did want to see uh, any of my final thoughts on the game that is covered in that video down below but I played that one six times over seven hours. I do really enjoy that one, it's a very interesting game but very different from the side experience if you are wanting to go into it with that mindset. It is based inside the universe and feels with like Scythe in terms of the, the essences and the atmosphere you're creating but it is just like an engine builder with no other mechanisms in there so very different experience. Uh, the next one on my list is a new one so this is one that I do have a solo playthrough of as well so check that out down below if you want more in-depth thoughts but this is one that I played just four times in February over three hours so again just under an hour to play through this one and this one is witchcraft so witchcraft is actually a game it's a card game that is based on the resist game resist is i believe like a war theme and it's one that i've heard about it's a solo only game um and so i've heard about it and i know that it's very well loved but the theme is just not my cup of tea so i sort of haven't really looked any more into it but witchcraft, the aesthetics of this one, like purpley, moody, and all of those sorts of atmospheres, I love it. And the just overall witchcraft theme and the familiars really, really piqued my interest. So I wanted to have a look at this one. This is a really interesting game because what you're going to be doing is you, you are playing as a coven of witches and there's various witch families that you are playing with. So there may be just one singular witch of a particular name and then you may have five I think there's like five Sullivans that you can collect in your hand and they sort of all bounce off each other so if you get the same family members all in your hand at the same time they can really power each other up um, these you are trying to help these witches prove their innocence to the village that they live in but at the same time tackle the evil forces that are coming in. It's very like Cthulhu-like in terms of atmosphere and so there's lots of evil goings on and you are trying to tackle this evil at the same time as try and convince everyone in your town and in particular these three jurors that you're going to have on your table of your innocence and that you are a witch yes but you are a good witch you are not part of this evil activity so in this game you are going to be picking one of three different tasks missions available to you as something like evil going on in the town so it might be um i can't remember off the top of my head but it's something like something's going on in the school so there's ghouls in the school say and so you may choose to tackle that one and it has a difficulty setting um, and you need to play witches from your hand to sort of uh, beat the strength of that particular mission. But at the same time, you've also got, I can't remember, there's, there's two like names. Is it like encounters? I'm going to go with encounters. There's missions and encounters. I think it's challenges, actually. So there's challenges as well under that particular mission. So there's going to be minions that are there basically causing havoc and getting in your way of your particular mission. So... Once you have selected your mission, you can choose whatever witches that you want to play from your hand. You have usually have five in your hand at a time. You may have curses that are blocking up your hand as well. And you can choose to play witches 
um, in any order, activating them for their hidden side, so they are using a tiny little bit of their magical ability, but trying to keep their witch status hidden from the village. So you're going to be usually uh, activating like a lesser strong power, or you can be revealing them to the whole village. They're going to be exploding with power and really hammering down on these like, minions and challenges. But at the end of that round, that witch is going to be arrested. They're going to be in jail and they're going to be unavailable for, for the rest of the game unless you can get them out somehow. In addition to their strength values, that they're going to be... It, it, sometimes you can like manipulate that. So as I said before, you're going to be having like different covens of witches, different family members. So if you play multiple Sullivans in a row, they may sort of beef each other up. Um, but an, as well as that, they also have additional powers. So some of them may allow you to capture familiars that may be there at present at that mission. They may allow you to manipulate the persuasion over the jurors on the on the table uh, and all of those sorts of things. So really, really interesting mechanics there. Once you have beat that mission or allocated the strength of overall strength of your witches out to your various uh, missions and challenges. If you beat that particular mission, you win persuasion over a juror of the associated type. And so you've got these tracks uh, that you are pushing up for all your jurors and which represents the persuasion. And at the end of the game, or you choose when you end the game, basically, it has natural ends if you have a few bad things happen to you. You can end the game and it results in a loss. But ultimately, you are sort of in control of when you approach the end of the game, if you want to go to trial and convince these jurors of your innocence. And at that time, you reveal two hidden cards. You may reveal them in the game using special mechanisms, uh, which is really helpful, but usually they're hidden. And you reveal them, the total of that is how far up the persuasion track of that juror you need to be in order to persuade them. Really, really interesting game, and I love the theme of it and how all of the family members can really sort of bounce off each other. Very, very, very fun. This one also has um, like a story mode with it. And I, I actually purchased this game wanting that to be like my main mode of play. And that was what sort of intrigued me because I was trying to like, Keystone North America has really spoiled me. That's like my favorite smaller box game, but you can play like Keystone North America just normally, which is great. But what I really love is the solo mode where it has that solo journal and you have like a little bit of story and it gives you extra rules and win loss conditions, all of that. Love that so much. And this witchcraft has that sort of aspect. You have, I think it's nine different scenarios that you can go through. It's like a little story mode. So they have different uh, rules that you can implement and also different end game conditions. I have only played two of those so far still. I haven't actually um, got it out again since I did my playthrough. But I was a little bit disappointed because I found the first two of them very easy. And also it seems like the whole story mode re removes the final aspect of the game. So you are still like facing missions and overcoming challenges and all of that stuff, but you do not have that final a step at the end of the game where you are facing those jurors and convincing them of your innocence. And I actually found that that was a very nice uh, aspect of the game to like ramp up to. It was a really nice like climax at the end of the game and created a fair bit of tension and not having that didn't spoil my enjoyment, but it definitely took it down a notch in terms of excitement. So I coupled that aspect with the fact that I actually found the scenarios and the criteria quite easy to play and they also were a lot shorter to play. It was about half the time I took to play through the first two as compared to a normal game. So I was a little bit underwhelmed and so I'm hoping that the rest of the scenarios actually ramp up a little bit but I'm not sure that they will. But anyway, the, the base game itself, um, when you strip away the like story mode, I was very impressed with. It is solo only, so you can't play it two player or anything, but it was a very, very fun experience. I think I said this in my playthrough as well. And as much as I love the aesthetics and the purples, like the cover is like, brilliant. I, if I could have like a poster of that, I would love that. But I, and as much as it translates into the majority of the artwork in the game, I love the mission artwork. I love the challenges artwork. I don't actually love the witches themselves. I thought that they were very bland and I wanted to see, because you have such like close-knit family members that are, you're really sort of trying to 
group together to really get those bonuses going. I would have liked to have seen some, whether it's like elements of their actual artwork or colour elements brought in to really sort of create that synergy of the different witch families, which is missing. They're all very similar, like the revealed side of the witches and the hidden side of the witches are different, but apart from that, they're very like monotone. So that was a bit of a disappointment to me. I'm not sure why they, they went down that route. But other than that, this is a very good looking game, looks really good on the table and is a real fun time. So just reeling off some other games that I have spoken about many, many times before. Uh, February, I played Cascadia four times over two hours. I'm really enjoying the uh, the challenges, the, the solo challenges that they have. Is it scenarios? It's not really a scenario, it's like scoring criteria, but they are becoming quite difficult now and so I, they're a real good time. They're, they're not so much relaxing that you can just sort of poodle about with something in the telly in the background. You do need to focus and you need to be continuously counting up your score along the way and figuring out how to maximise those points. So it's a good, good shift in challenge and I think there's a really good um, variety of ways to play. You can really have a, like a nice relaxing mindless experience if that's what you want which is really cosy and um, like calms you down or you can really go the other way and really want to work your brain. Cartographers I played twice over an hour as well. Love Cartographers, really relaxing game. Um, I believe I spoke about this one maybe a year ago or so now and I played Hitsy Road twice uh, for 51 minutes, very precise. Uh, but Hitsy Road is, there's not much to say about it because it is a very simple game. It's one I picked up for an absolute bargain price, but basically, um, I, I won't go into it because I believe I have spoken about it a couple of times before, but in essence, it is just a kid that has created his like game in a zombie apocalypse. So all of the elements that you're playing with are rehashed bits of games that he's found and collected around everywhere that he's been during the zombie apocalypse so that you're playing with bottle caps for the currency and parts of old board games so you, one of the uh, scoring criteria for that you use in multiplayer games I believe actually is like written on the back of a Dixit card and things like that so in terms of components it's one of the best that I've seen it it puts a smile to my face every time I get it out and gameplay wise it's a very simple uh, like point collection, you are trying to uh, roll dice against these zombies that you are facing, or hordes of zombies trying to balance your ammunition and your energy to tackle these zombies, and your fuel to escape various tricky situations and hordes of zombies, and you're just trying to get as many points as possible. So, nice little game, nothing too exciting going on, but just something that. It's quite, just a bit different to play. It plays a bit different from anything else that I have in my collection. Uh, the next one on my list is a two-player only game. So I will briefly, briefly talk about it, but um, you know, it doesn't really fit my channel. But this is Onatama. So I played Onatama twice over 40 minutes. So my husband and I played this one back to back. Um, Onatama is a a, an abstract strategy game. So it's basically chess um, with only four like pawns and your king and they're all in a line and the moves that all of these pieces can do is dictated by five cards in the game at any one time. So you have two cards in your hand and there's a card that is in the middle between both players and the only moves that you can do on your turn with any of your pieces are set out on your two cards that you're holding. Once you have decided which card you're playing, which may say, like your left card may say you can choose any piece and it can move one space forward or two spaces to the left, and that's it. And so whatever card you have chosen and you can select which piece you want to move, make your move and that card goes in the center and you pick up the one that was already in the center. So there's a very interesting balance of trying to see what cards your, your opponent has, trying to, keep the best cards out of the center of the table and try and keep them in your hand until the best possible moment and being very mindful about all of the potential spatial possibilities and like a bit like chess you 
win the game if you manage to like checkmate their king or if you manage to get your king to the opposite king's space. I am not a massive abstract strategy fan. I find these sorts of games extremely difficult to like plan for. I'm never going to be a chess master or anything like that. Um, so as, as much as I appreciate this is a game that I can play with anyone as long as somebody has played like chess or checkers or something like that in their history they will have a reasonable grasp of how to play this game from the off and the rule set is so light and I actually have a German copy so <laughs> it, you don't even need like, any there's no language barrier or anything it's so simple to play uh, but you do sort of need to have like an enjoyment of those spatial puzzles like chess um, it just strips out all of the complexities of chess and that massive board um, and I do think as well that you do need to like a a reasonable turnover of turns because I can get analysis paralysis very easily and my husband can as well with this game so we do sort of try and if we're taking too long we just make a move and we, we just need to have that quick quicker turnover. So Onatama is a very interesting little game and I would highly recommend it to those of you that want to play a game that you can play with absolutely anyone because I played this with my mum as well who's not a particular gamer um, and she enjoyed that very much and <laughs> it's one that I don't... <laughs> I like getting out with people because it's easy to teach and they enjoy it but I don't like getting it out equally because I am so bad at it and I lose against everyone. <laughs> so the next game on my list I played once over one hour and that is Everdell. So again I believe that was the solo mode that I have printed off because I do not like the base game solo mode with Rugwort. Um, I find that quite dull but I've printed off a solo mode from Board Game Geek and I, I much prefer that. It's a really really nice game to play and it means that Everdell is actually finding some more playtime that it otherwise wouldn't have because I would otherwise just tend to play it multiplayer and it's not one that we tend to play for some reason, not sure why, but uh, I've spoken about that one before so we'll move on. The next one on my list for February was Suburbia. I played Suburbia once over 53 minutes and this was actually one that I played with the intention, um, I have been getting rid of some games in my collection and Suburbia was potentially on the chopping block. So I played, my husband and I played Suburbia, this was a two player game. The solo mode, it was actually the first game I ever played solo. So it has a little bit of a special place in my heart because this is what opened up solo gaming to me. I never really knew that you could play solo games until my husband turned around to me one day when I was pestering him during lockdown to play a game with me. He said, well, like, there's, there's games that say like one to four players, like, why don't you try it? Like, play, play with, with yourself. And I was like, oh, didn't really ever think about that before. And so I tried Suburbia and it blew me away, even though it's actually in hindsight, not a particularly great solo mode from my point of view. Um, so yes, we, we played this one multiplayer to sort of see whether it warranted getting moved on from my collection. Suburbia, if you're not sure, is a game where you are build, basically building up your city with um, tiles. So you have uh, like green tiles, which are your like housing. You have uh, yellow tiles, which are your like, industrial areas. And you have gray tiles, which are your business areas. So your offices and things like that, and your like utilities and they all have like different scoring bits and it's like a bit of a spatial puzzle as well so if you are putting lots and lots of factories next to your green areas then your people aren't going to be particularly happy and your population may drop whereas if you build up your industrial areas and your utilities lots and lots and lots and you build fancy things like casinos and lots of airports and things like that your money may increase quite a lot but your population may increase a bit but then stagnate because you haven't got enough housing things like that very clever and every time you are trying to pick a tile is you've got to quite carefully think about where you're placing it on your board to trigger all of these little bonuses but also it's quite interesting when you're playing multiplayer because it, it is going to be influencing what somebody else does it may you, you have to be quite aware of what they are building because if they're building an extra restaurant and they've already got three restaurants your competition is going to be quite different and it's going to just affect different things on your own like, player area very interesting game 
and so we played it and really did enjoy it. I absolutely crushed my husband for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's quite a difficult game to get going. Like if you if you make a couple of mistakes towards the beginning of the game and you can't get enough money turnover or the right tiles aren't really coming out for you at the correct times, it can sort of stagnate and be really difficult to like push beyond that. Um, and I think I was quite lucky with a few accumulations that I got to really like just get everything going on a bit of a, like a rolling basis. Um, so I will say that the solo modes as well are not my favourite, there's not much clarity of how to play it and it is quite a... I personally find it quite dull just because I quite like the aspect of being able to see what other players are doing and trigger those little bits. Um, so we came away from it thinking it's okay, we did enjoy it, but if I need to get rid of more games in the future it will be potentially one that gets pushed out. But as I said, like this is one that I played for the first time solo, and so it it is sort of a, a close to my heart a little bit. But anyway, that's suburbia. So the only one left now that I do want to talk about for February is a game that I picked up. If, if you're in the UK, we have a game, a um, a shop called The Works, which is like a stationery shop, and uh, they also sell like books and puzzles, and they have. I haven't really seen them recently but they do sell board games as well sometimes and it's one that I picked up in there for about £10 years and years and years ago before I was really into the hobby just because I was like oh this is a new board game I'm gonna buy it because it was really cheap and actually it's one that I really really enjoy um it is a two player only game again so I will quickly go through it but this game I played once with my husband is called Sun Tzu this game has such a simple concept but it's very, very tension building and I personally find it quite uh, exciting to play. So all that's happening in Sun Tzu is, is a one versus one game. You have a map of China, I'm assuming, I think. <laughs> and there's five or six, one, two, there's six, five or six, I can't remember, districts of China. And you are trying to fight for the majority of these districts. So you have an army of like 20 different uh, soldiers, each soldier represents like a division, and you are, have a hand of cards. And your hand of cards, but the base values are like one to six, but you do accumulate extra cards, which may give you like extra powers, like a plus two or plus three, it may give you a plague to like kill off your opponent's soldiers. And you're gonna be secretly selecting one of the cards in your hand to place at each of these uh, provinces or regions of China. And then simultaneously, you and your, your partner, whoever you're playing against, are gonna reveal your cards that you've selected for a particular region, and whoever has the majority there is gonna place that many armies in that area. So if I have selected one as my value in the province and uh, my husband has selected three, he, the difference of those numbers is two, so he's gonna be putting two of his armies in that province. And so on, you're just gonna go down. And at the end of the round, you're gonna be scoring for whoever has the majority army in that particular area. And it's a real tug of war. So um, I think you score at the end of every three rounds. And so there's, you get three rounds and then you score and then three rounds and then you score and then another three rounds and then that's the final scoring. And oh, it's just such a interesting little game because what I particularly like are your little, uh, your cards that you can get as you go through the game as well so like I said you can have like plague cards so when you play a plague it kills half of the armies in the opposite area so you can kill your own armies if you find that you've got too many people in one area and so you, you've definitely got the majority in that particular area but now you've not got any armies to really move elsewhere or to get the majority anywhere else and it may only be scoring because the scoring that you're you're getting for each province as well is going to be changing every three rounds so it may score you six points in the first like, three rounds but then it's going to drop to like two and you're like well two points isn't as exciting anymore so actually i want to pull my forces back and allocate them elsewhere really really fun game plays in about half an hour uh creates a lot of tension i personally find it very exciting it's one that um keeps my interest really really high like i said i think i picked it up for like 10 pounds component quality is really nice as well it's you know nothing special for a 10 pound game but you have all your little army minis that you're like pushing around the board really really 
brilliant two-player game and it's very simple to teach as well. So I would highly recommend Sun Tzu if um, you like sort of like area controly type games but you want to just push all of that like complexity out. Super simple game. And the very final one that I played in February was just Squire for Hire over 10 minutes. I only played that one once but Squire for Hire remains to be my game for when I cannot be bothered to do anything. Brilliant little hand, pocket sized game. So now we move on to March. So March was a better gaming month for me. Uh, I played 38 different times and so just looking actually, February I played 12 different games, March I played 13 and that's over all 31 days of course and 35 hours. So the first game that I'm going to talk about, and I have spoken about it a couple of times on the channel, but I haven't spoken about it for about a year now, I would have thought. So Frosthaven is back out on the table at the moment <laughs> after like a six month break. We've played that one 13 times in uh, March for 17 hours. So good beefy game. And I will say that I haven't played this one solo since my last like batch. So I think six months ago, uh, when we first, uh, I played, we played it in three sort of sections. So when we first got it, we played it for like a month or two. Uh, it was on the table. Then we packed it up. Six months ago, we got it out again for a few weeks. Packed it up. Now this is the third like segment that we're playing through. And I, I think I've sort of the third time lucky or third time around, I think I'm knocking it on the head with the solo modes. The solo modes are very difficult. Um, if I'm not playing the character, you need to be familiar with the character to even get to the point of being able to, or even remotely able to pass the scenario because it really relies on you being familiar with those cards, familiar with the mechanisms and how to really get the most out of your movements and your attacks. And it's just, I think, a bit underwhelming as well because you can only, or technically only, tackle these scenarios when you're level five in the solo mode. And by the time you reach level five, a lot of the time you're sort of erring on the edge of retirement or getting there. And so it never really matches up. And the only thing you sort of get once you uh, tackle the solo scenarios and, you know, mute me if you don't want to know any spoilers, but you get a reward with a special item that you can use for your character class and I found that to be nice but the ones that I've got before have just been nice not anything groundbreaking so it's not a game that I have been particularly loving solo but multiplayer it's still a huge amount of fun I will say it is difficult to sort of dive back into after a period of time especially like now I have no real connection or clue what's really going on in the story and I'm now trying to tackle through the puzzle book as well and some of those rely on previous information that you may have come across and so I've had to like cheat on those because I have no idea what I read a year ago and so all of those aspects are frustrating and slows up the game but Frosthaven really is like a triumph of gaming it's such a brilliant cooperative uh, game to play with someone who's really into that sort of thing as well and all of the character classes play so differently and a, a real joy to get to know and to it's so exciting when you get a new character I've recently retired two at once because I'm double handing it and we've got two new characters to play and oh the excitement that I felt when I was building all of them up and choosing who I wanted to play it was great so Frosthaven is one that continues to live on in our collection and um, according to the, the app that we're using to, because uh, you, you can have narrative, it's an all recorded narrative, so you can play through that, which is really, really good. The narrative is really spot on and really enhances the experience, but I think we're only about a quarter of the way through all the scenarios. And don't get me wrong, that you won't see everything in the game because naturally what you're going to be doing is making choices about the scenarios and the decisions that you make, and you're going to be locking yourselves out of various branches of story. So um, you won't necessarily see everything, but I reckon we are probably like a third, maybe two fifths of the way through or something like that. So it's still good, good number of plays left in the brilliant, brilliant game. 
The next game for March on my list, I played five times. I was really on a new kick of this one. Gans Sean Clever for two hours. Love this game so much. It is one of my favorite games in my collection. Gans Sean Clever is just so easy to get out. For 20 minutes, so addictive. And I got my best ever score the other day, but it's still only, I think, three stars. It's really difficult to push into those higher scores, but I will reach there one day. Um, but I absolutely love Gangstrong Clever and I would recommend it to any gamer at all. It's got no theme, so nobody can moan about it or not like it or anything like that. As long as, like, it was one that I wasn't particularly super excited to pick up. I picked it up because I'd heard good things and it's portable. Um, but I'm so glad I did because the gameplay of it is just so, so addictive. Okay, so the next one on my list I have spoken about before and have got a, a playthrough of this one, but I wanted to speak about it again because I played it in a different way. So I played this one over six hours, four um, times. And this is Stardew Valley, the board game. So normally Stardew Valley is a game that you play, uh, you can play it solo or multi-handed or cooperative, whatever you want to do um, and you play one year of Stardew Valley and you try and achieve four of grandpa's goals and also satisfy open and satisfy all of the rooms in the community center. I have taken or somebody actually um, on my clover I think made me aware of this mode on Maggie from uh, Think of Thema. She sort of developed her own a little like not a campaign but her big better version or better version of Stardew Valley the board game where she wanted like the whole experience she wanted to play or satisfy like the whole lot in as little time as possible but she didn't like to be like time constricted and so I tried to do this <laughs> and it took me I think three days to play through but basically what happens you are trying to uh satisfy each and every one of the community center bundles you are also going to try your best to do all of grandpa's goals absolutely all of them and you have a no real time limit so the idea is that you're going to be trying to do it in as little years as possible i think i managed to do it in three years which was not too bad actually but you have up to i think five years is the number that you can really get to uh, if you put all of the cards in the game, obviously you can then reshuffle them and do it again. But the target was like, within five years, you want to try and do everything. And it was so much fun. There's like different rules that she implemented where at the end of a year, you would sort of strip back all your money and you'd have costs to upkeep all of your buildings and your friends will sort of disappear unless you sort of give them gifts and talk to them, you know, that sort of thing to keep it thematic and to try and keep that challenge going a little bit. Uh, which was really interesting. It, it got a bit chaotic towards the end. Um, but I appreciate it's only one person's like just ideas being thrown around in the house she likes to play it. But there were a few things that I wasn't quite sure about. And the, the end of the, the campaign, it got completely chaotic because one of the grandpa's goals is to befriend. Uh, no, sorry. There was additional like win criteria as well. So you want also wanted to um, befriend every single villager by the end of the game and so I was <laughs> I don't know how many villagers there are but I had like 15 of them all in one go and so every time you would get a gift from your uh, like event that's triggering at the at the beginning of a uh, month <laughs> I would be triggering like 15 different things and gaining so much money so many hearts and it was it was chaos but it was so much Fun. I love Stardew Valley the video game and this board game really just takes a lot of the elements of this. It is a cooperative experience so it's really nice to play multiplayer and actually I quite enjoy triple handing this one outside of the campaign. I, I wouldn't triple hand a campaign. <laughs> I'm not sure how that would work but uh, it really brings a lot of joy. There's definitely elements of luck in this game uh, especially the mining aspects. You're going to be rolling dice to descend in the mine and if you're rolling the wrong things again and again and again, there are ways that you can offset that a little bit, but if you're just basically rolling the wrong things at the wrong time, it, it will be to your detriment and you will lose the game. But just a bit of lighthearted fun and I think Stardew Valley is a real gem of a game, especially if you do like the um, 
uh, the theme of it as well. So I would highly recommend you checking that out from Maggie from Thinkathema uh, if you were interested on in sort of exploring a little bit more of Stardew Valley the board game. It is not a super streamlined experience or anything like that but it was definitely a lot of fun and you know just a different way to play a game and it's always nice to have like a fresh look at a board game especially when you played it a number of times and you know you're ready to like push it back on the shelf for a little bit it's nice to have that that refresh I guess. So the next ones I think mostly we have spoken about a lot of these before so I won't say much more. Iranian Burger Canal again I played four times in March I played Witchcraft a further three times. Paperback Adventures I played twice over an hour and a half. Oh, Paperback Adventures is such a gem of a game for me. I absolutely love it. I love the theme of it, how it's implemented. It's If, if you're not sure, um, I will pop a link to the playthrough down below so you can see my final thoughts in more in depth. But Paperback Adventures is basically a, a, a battle, a boss battling game using words. So you are playing as a hero, a, a protagonist in a, a novel, and you're going to be going up against, uh, you're playing through book one, book two, and book three. But basically each book you are facing a lackey and then the final boss, and through playing different words in your hand and either splaying the cards to the left or to the right to spell different things, um, and activating the power on the top card in your hand. You're going to be dealing damage to your enemies. You're going to be giving them curses. You're going to be getting yourself like boons to to spend in the shop after. Um, brilliant little game. And all of the the characters that you're going up against, the the um, the bosses and the lackeys, present a very different challenge every single time. So some of them may focus on a lot of defense and they're really difficult to like take down. They've got like five health, but they're very difficult to break for all of that defense. Or they may be like cursing you and curses may do different things to you, really detriment like, the number of cards you can draw in your hand or something like that. And some of them are a real challenge. So at the moment, what I like to do is sort of save my game after each book. So I've played through book one at the moment and I did take a bit of a hit. So I have 20 health usually. I'm now down to 14 at the end of book one. So it isn't a great ending to book one. So um, I've tried to play book two twice now and I have failed both times, but I'm just gonna keep going at book two until I can get a win and then try and get a win at book three until I get bored and then restart <laughs> the book one again. It is quite a challenging game and uh, it's highly replayable in that there's a lot of different lackeys and bosses that you can go and um, mix and match. You can, there's, I think there's, I'm not sure if there's three or four, I think there's definitely three bosses of each book, but you can mix and match whatever ones you want as long as it's to the appropriate book. So there's lots of different combinations you can go to and there's so many items and things like that that you can obtain for your character as well. Um, I, this one though, I just didn't like the way that they'd set it up in terms of how to play, in terms of you have to buy a core box, which you can't play with alone. You then have to buy a separate expansion box, which is one of your characters. And so I, I can only play with the damsel that I have bought. Um, and that's the only character that I have. If I wanted to play with another character, I'd have to buy a, another box, so which would be my third box of paperback adventures. And so it's not great in terms of like space saving on your shelves or anything like that. So that's the only thing that I don't particularly like about it. But other than that, I think it's a real, really brilliant solo game. And you just don't hear about it spoken about. And I think that's a real shame. So I think it's a real gem. So uh, the next one that I played in in March was At the Gates of Luoyang. I played that one once for 56 minutes. I'm trying to, because I'm sort of coming to the end of my Uwe Rosenberg solo series, I'm trying to uh, like replay some of these older titles that I haven't touched for like a good year now because this, this series has been going on for a while and I did take a good substantial break from it. Um, and I don't think it's fair to like rank them again now because my, my feelings about a game now may be very different to what it was a year ago and especially as I feel like I've just gained a lot more gaming knowledge in general so I'm trying to like revisit a lot of these titles again and I think I will take like a good two week break of like, filming and anything else to really just play all of the Uves back to back again and do consolidate my final thoughts on all of them but other case of Loyang is just a fabulous fabulous game really enjoy it it's 
and I think it really lends itself to the solo mode in this rather than two or, or multiplayer. I like a two player as well, but I think the solo mode is really on point. Basic trading, growing vegetables, and that's basically all you're doing. It's selling vegetables, buying vegetables, planting vegetables, harvesting vegetables, everything vegetable. It's just really brilliant. It looks absolutely gorgeous as well. My, I was playing it up at my um, mother-in-law's over Christmas and she came, she's not particularly interested in games, but she did come over and have a look at the game and was like, oh, that's very pretty. I was like, I know, there's a looker on the table. <laughs> And uh, just finishing off with the final few then, we've got Genotype. I played Genotype once in March for 55 minutes. I am so desperate to get this one back out and I, I'm really, really dying to do a playthrough of this one because again, I don't think as many people talk about this one as they need to. I find the solo mode in this one to be very, very good. It is very difficult and that is why what I usually do is I buy a board game, I play it lots and lots, film a playthrough of it, and then it goes on the shelf for a bit. Um, I bought this one, played it lots and lots, still didn't win the solo mode. I'm not sure if I've ever won, I might have won once. And I was like, I can't film a playthrough right now. Like, I'm, I'm not going to advertise myself as this poor of a gamer of gene, genotype. It, it's embarrassing. So uh, I need to get it out and I need to play it a good number of times and then I'll just record it. And I think I've got over that now. If I'm rubbish, I'm rubbish, I don't care. I wanna showcase this game because it's a really, really great title. So at some point you will see a playthrough, hopefully of Genotype, um, but not yet, <laughs> I need to play it lots. Uh, again, Keystone North America, I'm carrying on the little scenarios in that one. Uh, 46 minutes, one play. The Bloody Inn, I played once as well. Honey Buzz, um, I played that one two player. Honey Buzz is definitely one that I like but I don't particularly want to play it solo because I find it's quite a lot of setup because I don't have an insert for it. So all of the tiles are in this big bag that I need to separate. And because it's only a half an hour, 40 minute playtime, I feel like it's just a lot of setup or not a lot of gameplay. And as well, I, I feel like the two player experience is just a bit short. I just wanted a bit more from it. So as beautiful as it is and aesthetically pleasing and lovely and thematic, as thematic as it can be like, you know, making honey and all of that, I think it's a really, really charming game. And I'm looking forward to perhaps playing it with some more people. I just, nowadays, I think I just want a bit more from my games. And so I, I keep it, I think, because it's so family friendly and I can introduce it to people, but I'm not sure how long how much long longevity it will have in my collection going forward. And then finally, we're just gonna end off with Uno I played once and Dobble I played once in March as well. I know a lot of people like turn their noses up at little party games like that, like Uno, there's, they will say there's a lots and lots of games that are much better than Uno. I'm sure there are, but I, I do love a bit of Uno. <laughs> it's just a chaos and a lot of fun. And uh, Dobble is one of my absolute favourites as well for a silly party game. So that is it for all of the games I played in February and in March. Uh, I was going to say all the games I played solo in February and March, but there are quite a few two-player uh, entries in this time round. But anyway, I think I will try and keep these to maybe bi-monthly because they definitely work a bit better in this format, I think. I have a bit more to talk about in terms of games that we may have talked about before, but also newer entries because uh, my turnover of games is a little bit less than it has been in the past. But anyway, thank you so much for joining me today. Let me know what favorite games you've been playing in the last couple of months as well. Any big gems that you have found or stumbled across, whether they're newer games or old, do like a good oldie on my lists as well. So thank you very much. If you did enjoy the content today, please consider subscribing to the channel and you'll be let know of any future releases that I do. Otherwise have a lovely rest of your day and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.